Welcome to Marriage Day Podcast. I'm Jimmy Evans. This is my wife, Karen. This podcast exists to help every couple thrive in marriage, and you can. You just need the right information. We're talking in a series called I Changed My Mind, and this is a series that I did talking about our thoughts, the importance of our thoughts, and what happens when we have wrong thoughts, the danger of that, and how to replace them. And this is talking about I Changed My Mind About Insecurity. Uh, I think that everyone's insecure about something. Uh, Some people are insecure about almost everything. And so this message will really help you to understand from the life of the Apostle Paul how we can be truly secure in God. Karen, thank you for joining me today. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. And we've got some questions from our viewers that we're going to talk about here. I think you have a question. I've been married twice over the past 20 years, and I'm considering marrying again. How can I ensure a successful marriage this time? Well, uh, Getting the right information, and you know, I have Four Laws of Love book, Marriage on the Rock. We have XO Marriage. We have all kinds of information. Getting the right information, also making sure that you're marrying someone uh, that is a believer. Um, I believe that uh, God is the most important factor in a good marriage. I agree. And if you share the same faith and the same values, that's the most important thing. It's not chemistry. And chemistry. Well, and guys can say they're Christians and it's like, oh, well, that's right. <laughs> you need to know a person long enough that you know that they're mm-hmm. a Christian or not. You need to see them respond to different phases of life. We have a friend that's been dating, uh, online dating for the last three or four or five years. It's, it's a woman, and she has been very wise because she has met several men that she thought could be the right one. But over a process of months, they both did things that let her know that they weren't the right one. Mm-hmm. And so you have to know someone long enough. Um, there, there's two people involved in the marriage, and both the people have to be willing to work at the relationship. Mm-hmm. So if if you're wanting a successful marriage, get the right information, read some good books, Christian books, but make sure that the person that you're marrying is committed to the same things you are, that you have the same values, the same vision for your life and things like that. Very, very important. Well, and I think don't avoid the red flags. I mean— Lord gives us the Holy Spirit for a reason to give us those nudges that say something's not right. So listen to those little nudges, and if there's a red flag, right. you know, investigate it. Okay. Well, so David and Ashley Willis, uh, the, that are part of XO here, they have a website, premarriage.com, and it's preparing to say I do. It's it's uh, preparing to get married, and it's a premarriage course that you can get mm-hmm. on premarriage.com. I would encourage you to do yeah, that with right. with your fiance. Um, this is one for you, Karen. My parents weren't the best examples of how to raise children. What are some steps I can take to change that for my children? Well, definitely, you and I were raised with. <laughs> good... Our parents weren't Christians. No, our parents weren't Christians, so we were not raised, you know, with what I call good parents. Um, and so, but I, you know, we love them to death. I mean, I love our parents, and well, they're I... different people today. Yeah, you know. and. But I think that it's just so important to be around people that do good parenting. You know, find a couple of friends in your church or find a small group that has young families and put yourself around, you know, men and women, you know, couples that are the, the they model the biblical standards of a, what a good family looks like, you know, because you're, you're going to become like who you're around. That's right. And so, you know, find good friends, find um, families that uh, you respect and just ask them maybe to mentor you. You say, we'd love to know how do you do it. You know, you and I have done this. You well, know? That's, that's how we, we got married with all the wrong thoughts in our head related to values, priorities, parenting. And we got involved in church and we got around other couples. That's how I learned to be a father. My father never talked to me. He never touched me, never came to ball games. He was completely not a part of my life. And when I got around, and I, so I, I would have done exactly that same thing. But we got around other couples, and I would watch other men with their children, and I would see them fathering their children. And it literally taught me. I heard someone say one time, women learn by talking. Men learn by watching each other. And so you need a good example because you're going to be like the people you're around. So I think that it's uh, it's very, very important um, to get around the right role models. Read good books, but always Christian books and always books that agree with the Scriptures. And that's the but but the the biggest issue is what she just said here, uh, or what he just said here, and that is um, how knowing that your parents were not good role models, 
and knowing that you need something better. That's the battle right there. A lot of people never get to that point. Mm -hmm. So we hope that's helpful to you. This program, we're talking about changing your mind about insecurity and becoming secure. Karen was very insecure when we got married, had a dramatic impact on our marriage, but the Lord healed her. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk here about how to overcome insecurity. This message is called, I Changed My Mind About Insecurity. And I'm going to talk about the issue of insecurity that we all deal with and how to live a, a secure life different than the way the world lives. Now, this the, stay there in Psalm 91, if you would, but this is our scripture for this entire series. It's Romans 12, 2. It says, do not be conformed to this world. And that word conformed literally means like a schematic, to be identical to the way the world thinks but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That word transformed is where we get our word metamorphosis. And it says that you may be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, I wanna I want say this now, and I know that you'll agree with me, but, but this is the issue that we're dealing with. As believers, we should think differently than we did when we were unbelievers. And as believers, we should live differently than the world lives. We are the salt and we are the light of the world. That's what Jesus says. And for us to be the salt and light, it just simply means we're not arrogant, we're not self-righteous, but once we become saved, our minds become saved. You can be on your way to heaven, but you have an unsaved mind. In other words, you're thinking, you're conformed to the world. You're handling problems, you're dealing with situations the same as an unsaved person would. And we're all that way until our minds become transformed. And so we're talking about this wonderful gift that we have of being able to change our minds. Now listen to me, God doesn't control your thoughts. The devil doesn't control your thoughts. No one controls your thoughts but you. You're the gatekeeper of your mind. You decide what comes in and once it's there, you decide what stays. And regardless of where you've been in life and the circumstances that you've had in life and the family that you came from and the culture that you came from, understand we have the ability to expose, to challenge, and to expel any thought that is in our minds right now that doesn't belong there. We also have the ability to read, to believe, and to accept the Bible and to allow it to come into our minds and change the way we think. And when you change the way you think, you change everything about your lives. And it's a critical part of becoming a disciple of Jesus Christ. And this issue of insecurity, let me define insecurity for just a minute, but it just means a lack of confidence, basically, on a personal level. I lack confidence or I lack security. It means feelings of anxiety and uncertainty about myself. Is I just don't feel sure of myself. I don't, I don't feel certain about and there's a different ways that we can be insecure. One is called global insecurity. And I'll tell you Karen's story in just a minute. But when I met Karen, I've never met a more insecure person in my life than Karen 40 years ago. I met Karen 43 years ago. We've been married 40 years last week. But we dated for three years. Thank you very much. Thank you. We met in biology class in high school. And um, I thought Karen was the most beautiful woman I've ever seen in my life and uh, loved her from the first moment I saw her, but she hated herself. She had thoughts of suicide, self-harm. She thought she was fat, ugly, stupid. She actually thought that there was something wrong with her mentally and it couldn't be changed. And so I'll tell you in just a minute, Karen's story of how God transformed her life and, and freed her from insecurity. Uh, there's also you know, kind of situational insecurity. Uh, I was always a very confident person, but I had areas of insecurity in my life. So it might not be that you're just a, a completely insecure person, but I believe that every single person deals with the issue of insecurity, and we deal with it in some way. Some people, Karen, if you would have known Karen 40 years ago, you would have walked up, and in 30 seconds, you would have known this was a very insecure person. I mean, just the way she carried herself, she was just very shy, very insecure. But I dealt with my insecurities different. In fact, the more insecure I felt, the more macho I acted. And so if you walked up to me, if you walked up to Karen and you were kind of intimidating to her, she would just cow down and, and just go into, you know, kind of just a, uh, you know, a real shy type of a way. If you came to me and made me feel insecure, I'd shove my chest out at you and just stand and stare at you. 
but I was insecure on the outside, I was acting macho. Let me say this, you all deal with insecurities. We all deal with insecurities in our own ways, whether it's right or wrong, whether it's turning to God or turning to a substance, whether it's godly or not godly. I believe that every single individual feels insecure at times, and we deal with that, and it's either an opportunity for God or the devil. All of our insecurities, we're, we're going to deal with them in some way, right or wrong, and it's gonna become an opportunity for God or the devil. Let me say this, you'll either live your life insecure, falsely secure, or secure in God. And the only true answer for insecurity is a personal relationship with God. You'll hear me say that through this entire message. That is the only answer. And the world does not have security in God. When the Bible says, don't be conformed to this world, it's saying, don't solve your problems the way the world solves problems. Let me say this, and you know that I'm telling you the truth. The world finds security in money, right? And there are financial instruments that are called securities. But I think in 2008, we learned they're not so secure, right? There's a woman, I'm from the Texas Panhandle, and there's a, one of the families that found a lot of the oil and gas in the Texas Panhandle, uh, and I grew up in a community with their name everywhere. They were very philanthropic people. Hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars. And good people, they were just very generous people. Um, one of our pastors, before he came on our staff, he was a stained glass artist. And he was doing some work in one of her homes. She had homes all over the world. She had an apartment in New York City. She was a huge donor to the uh, Metropolitan Opera. And so she had been robbed at knife point in New York City, uh, in her apartment there, and robbed of jewelry, artwork, things like that. So one of our pastors, before he became one of our pastors, is in her home doing some work there, and she just sat down next to him and started talking to him. And here's what she told him. I live in constant, everyday fear that I'm gonna get killed for my money. And a lot of us would think, or maybe we would hope, that we would get enough money to feel secure. See, actually, she had hundreds of millions of dollars, and it was a source of her insecurity. If you believe that money will make you secure, you're deceit. Jesus called it the deceitfulness of riches. Money's a blessing. Money's a good thing. Listen, money's important. God is essential. And money can bring some security. God can bring total security. And I'm not saying that money's not important. I'm not saying that relationships are not important. I'm not saying having a good job and even our appearance. I'm not saying it's unimportant. I'm saying those things are important. He is essential. And I'm saying if you have all of those things, you can still live a very insecure life because those things cannot bring us security. Only God can. Well, let me tell you several stories, beginning with Karen's. I told you about Karen being insecure. When we got married, Karen, uh, she was saved, but she didn't believe that God loved her, and, and she, it was hard for her to believe she was saved. She hated herself. She was full of self-hate. And uh, I would tell her how beautiful she was, but to her, she was fat, ugly, and stupid. That's the way she thought about herself. And she hated, she hated uh, herself, but she wanted to know God, but she didn't know that God loved her. But she made a decision when we got married that she would read the Bible every day. Here's a good verse of scripture just to jot down. Psalm 107, 20. Here's what it says. God sent his word to heal them and to deliver them from all of their destructions. Karen made a decision 40 years ago that she was gonna read the Bible every day. Now, she didn't believe the loving parts of the Bible. She believed Leviticus, you know, she believed the, the law chapters of the Bible, the judgment chapters. But when she read about the love of God, she didn't believe it. But here's what my wife has done. I've never known a day in 40 years under any circumstances that my wife has not read the Bible every day. It's the first thing she does. And what has, see, you don't read the Bible, the Bible reads you. Hebrews 4 says the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. When the word of God, the reason the Bible is a two-edged sword is one edge is a scalpel that heals us, the other edge is a sword that slays the enemies of God. The Bible is the software that our hardware was originally designed to run on. And when you read the Bible, it reprograms your hardware to think so that you can live successfully. That's why Psalm 1 says, the person who meditates on the Bible will succeed in everything they do. When you read the Bible, it reprograms your software and it also has a virus killing program in it. 
Literally, that's what happens when you read the Bible. So I had a wife full of self-hate and the lowest self-esteem of any person I've ever met. I have 30 first cousins. My dad had nine siblings. My mom had three. I've got relatives everywhere. So I would go and, uh, and introduce Karen to my relatives, and Karen would stand behind me. Anytime we were out in public, she stood behind me. And I would have to drag Karen out from behind me, introduce her, and as soon as I introduced her, she went right back behind me. And that's the way she was. She's just unbelievably insecure. But she started reading the Bible. And, and, and I was a, I, she thought she was the devil. I thought I was God. We were a perfect match. So that's kind of the way our relationship was. So, and I ran the home. I dominated Karen. I, you know, I, every time there was a problem, I convinced her it was her problem. But as she began to read the Bible, after a couple of years, she began to get confident. And she began to stand up to me. And I didn't like that. So one time I came home from playing golf because I golfed all the time. And she stood up to me. For the first time. And I, and I tried to sit her down like I always did. I tried to make her think it was her fault. And, you know, it's kind of, you, know, uh, you know, verbally a bully her there. And she didn't take it. And I thought, uh-oh. And I, that's the night I told her to get out of the house. I told her to get out, go back to her mom and dad or whatever. And that's the night that God broke through my heart and our marriage began to get healed. And today my wife is a lioness for God. I can't take any credit for it. God healed my wife as her, as her, my wife as her mind was transformed by the word of God. She read the Bible. No one can do this for you. No one can read the Bible for you. The devil wants your Bible gathering dust on the coffee table so he can destroy your life. Listen, before he defeats you, he disarms you. And the Bible is the sword of the spirit. You pick up that sword and you can defeat any enemy. Anything can happen when you get the word inside of you, but you've got to get the word inside of you. God doesn't control your thoughts. The devil doesn't control your thoughts. You control your thoughts. And the word of God is nuclear. It's not like any other thing. It's nuclear. It gets inside of you and it transforms you. And today, my, the wife that is full of self-hate, she loves herself. She loves God. Uh, you know, she's, she's healed. I, I think she's too healed, actually. She's dominating me now. I'm fighting for that, you know, so... Let me tell you another story, Miss King Saul. And I'll just tell you this story. It's recorded in 1 and 2 Samuel in the Bible, but God was the king of Israel. Israel was a different nation because God was their king. They didn't have a human king. They had God as their king, and they got tired of God being their king. And they told him that. They said, we want a human king like all the other nations. But think, about, think about that. And God said, I'm sorry that you're tired of me being your king. I think I'm doing a pretty good job. I think I'm a pretty good king. But because you've asked for a human king, I'm going to give him to you. And let me tell you, he's going to break your heart. And God told them exactly what would happen if they had a human king. And they said, we want a human king. So he gave him Saul. Saul was the first king of Israel, and he was a totally insecure man. And rather than turning his insecurities toward God, he did everything wrong. This is the story of a man who did everything wrong, and God regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. And Samuel then went and anointed David, who is a man after God's heart, and he re rejected Saul. Here are the seven signs of a Saul spirit. This is a person who is insecure, who rather than turning their insecurities to God, has turned them to within or somewhere else. And in Saul's case, it became demonized. Saul, Saul became this demonized man who tried to kill David and destroy everything that God was doing in his life. Here are the seven signs of a Saul spirit. Number one, unteachable and unapproachable. When you're insecure, no one can tell you anything. You're, you, you can't be approached. Everyone who came to Saul got the same treatment. He rejected them and wouldn't listen to what they had to say. Number two, jealous and envious. When David killed Goliath, they began to sing a song in Israel. And the song was, Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his tens of thousands. And that's why Saul became so jealous of David and tried to kill him. Now, I want to say this about competition. Listen to what I'm about to say. Christian parents should act like Christians at their children's sporting events. I'm going to let that sink in for just a minute. Because I have two children, and now I have grandchildren, and we go to sporting events. At Christian sporting events, our daughter Julie was seven years old, and she was in Little Dribbler's Basketball. And we went to a, her basketball game, and the other coach, the coach on the other team, was using every uh, curse word you can think of, screaming at his seven-year-old team to do better in basketball. Let me, let me say this now. 
If your ego is so fragile, if you're so insecure that you have to win at everything you're doing, that's telling you something's wrong. As believers, our security is not in always being the best or in winning, our security is in God. And we should be able to play a good game with good character and walk away, win or lose, and keep our dignity and other people's as well. When you can't do that, it just means you're insecure. And I, I know I've, I've played golf with some people that just, they couldn't lose and, and treat you. They, they would just lose their spirit in, in that. And so jealousy and envy, all of us deal with these issues, but when they become character traits, it's a dangerous thing. Number three is blame transfer. When uh, he was commanded, Saul was commanded to go destroy the Amalekites, he didn't do it completely. And when he came back, Samuel reproached him on it and he said, the people made me do it. It's the pe- couldn't, that's what Adam did with Eve. He blamed E. Number four is control. Anything Saul couldn't control, he tried to destroy. A controlling spirit. That was me when Karen and I got married. Anger and emotional instability is number five. He literally would have demonic fits of anger and try to kill David, try to pin David against a wall with a spear. And again, all of us deal with these things, but when it becomes entrenched in our lives, it can literally become an opportunity for the devil. Number six, unbelief and spiritual compromise is Saul went to a witch. Saul went to a witch. Christians shouldn't have anything to do with astrology. Uh, They they say I'm a Libra. I don't believe that the stars in the sky have anything to do with my life. I believe that God's a sovereign God and I have choices and I could care less what the stars are doing. Ouija boards, all that magic kind of stuff, it is wrong. We have a God in heaven, that's all we need. But Saul sought out a witch because he was so insecure. He was trying to find a place of security apart from God. Number seven is the fear of man. When he did not obey God regarding the Amalekites, he said, I feared the people. I feared what the people were going to think. Listen, I care about what people think, but Jesus said, beware of all, when all men speak well of you. It's good when people think well of us, but I'll tell you, as believers, sometimes they're not going to. We just have to get used to that. Let me say this, I want people to like me, but I will not surrender my Christian values for people to like me. And I'm okay with not being liked if it's because of my belief in Jesus Christ. So the fear of man, so that is a Saul spirit. This is a man who just was so completely insecure. And rather than turning that to God, he turned it inwardly. Here, let me finish by talking one more story quickly. And this is the apostle Paul, 2 Corinthians 12. Lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, the thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake, for when I'm weak, then I'm strong. Well, here's the opposite of a Saul spirit. And it's the apostle Paul. And Paul in 2 Corinthians 12, here's what he's saying. I went to heaven 14 years ago, and I don't know if I was in my body or out of my body, but I went to heaven and I saw things I can't even repeat. I I saw things I can't even describe because it's indescribable. And he says, but because of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. Now, let me say this. God either causes or allows everything. God did not cause his thorn in the flesh, but he allowed it. And so when he got this thorn in the flesh, it could have been an eye problem because in Galatians 3, he's describing he was having problems with his eyes. I don't know what it was, but he hated it. And he went to God three times and he said, God, take this thing away. And God's response was, my grace is sufficient for you, Paul, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Here are the three steps to dealing with insecurities. Number one is turn to God. Paul turned to God. Wherever you turn in times of insecurity, problems, fear, that is your security. Go to the secret place with God and make him your refuge and your fortress. Turn to him first. That's what Paul did. That's what we do to deal with insecurity. Number two, embrace your weakness. And I'm not saying that we never try to get better. I'm not saying that we should accept everything that comes into our lives. Listen to my magic wand theory. This this is my magic wand theory. 
If, we, if, if you had a magic wand, if I handed you a magic wand right now and I said to you, you can wave this magic wand over your life, your body, your life, and you can change anything you wanna change, okay? Here's what would happen. You would take that magic wand, you would wave it over yourself, and you would never need God again. Because you'd make yourself beautiful, rich, popular, powerful, right? That's why the magic wands are not available in the foyer. God, the things that we feel bad about and make us feel insecure are why we need God. If we could change what we don't like about ourselves, we wouldn't need God anymore. God loves being a daddy. God loves being a shepherd. We're sheep. God made us sheep. God made us to where we are weak. We're weak people. We're weaker than we would want to admit. We need a savior. We need a shepherd. We need God. And the way the world thinks when they're in need is they're trying to look for something, a substance, a thing, something on them or in them to change the way that they think and to make them feel secure. And it doesn't work. The difference between the way the world thinks and we think is they run to something, we run to someone. And we embrace our weaknesses. The apostle Paul ends, he, he begins by pleading with God, God, take this thing away. God, take this thing away. He ends by saying, I rejoice in my weaknesses. I rejoice in my infirmities. I rejoice in these things because when I'm weak, then I'm strong. What does that mean? When I turn my weakness to God, it becomes strength because God and me are a perfect team. I'm not that smart. He's a genius. I'm weak. He's powerful. I don't know where I'm going and he has a, an eternal perspective. We're the perfect team. When I admit that I need him, I need God, I need God, I need God, I need him. And that's the confession that leads to strength. That's the confession that leads to security. But we can't find God until we admit our need for God. And then the third thing that we do is put faith in God's grace. And what that means is you don't have to deserve it. You don't have to deserve anything. My grace is sufficient for you, Paul. Listen, when you need God most, you deserve him the least. I, I need him because I'm a mess, right? Anybody agree with that? I need him because I'm a mess. And what that means is because I'm a mess, I don't deserve him. You know what God says? Come jump in daddy's lap. I don't care how bad that diaper smells. Come on. You have grandkids, you know what I'm talking about. I've had near-death experiences over that stuff. <laughs> but let me tell you something, it doesn't matter because I love them and they're my kids. We can't get our act together till we get in daddy's lap. And daddy's lap is a lap of grace and love unconditionally. That regardless of where we are, what we've done or how bad we're messed up, daddy says, you come over here, baby. My grace will get you all fixed up. And the Apostle Paul ends by saying, I, I rejoice in everything in my life that I would ordinarily feel insecure about. I've changed my mind. Those things are simply reminders of how bad I need God. And when I go to Him, then I'm secure. Hey, this is Brent Evans with Exo Marriage, and I want to thank you for listening to the Marriage Today podcast. We believe your marriage has a 100% chance of success if you do it God's way. If you enjoyed today's teaching and want to keep learning, hey, subscribe to the Marriage Today podcast and take some time to leave us a review. Your reviews help us spread the word and can encourage someone else in need. For more great marriage content, check out exomarriage.com where you can see all of our marriage building resources, articles, and live events.